The labor leader who helped unionize the minor leagues now has a much bigger project in mind. Plus, three NFL teams want a new stadium or major renovations, and J.J. Reddick could go from co-hosting a podcast with LeBron James to being his coach. It's Thursday, June 6th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. NFL teams want a new stadium or major renovation as long as they can find a local government willing to make a deal. The Kansas City Chiefs are trying to figure out their next move. The voters rejected an initiative that would have given them public funds for a major renovation. A lobbying group called Scoop and Score is pushing for Kansas to promise public funds for a new Chiefs stadium. The state's House Speaker and Senate President have said they will explore the proposal during a special session on June 18th. Arrowhead Stadium has been good to the Chiefs, but enough public dollars could lure them across the Missouri River. Meanwhile, the Carolina Panthers and the city of Charlotte came out with a proposal that would have team owner Tepper Sports and Entertainment spend $150 million, and the city spend $650 million on renovations to Bank of America Stadium, with TSE covering up to $421 million of potential overages. For context, Charlotte's proposed budget for the 2025 fiscal year is $4.2 billion, while David Tepper's net worth is an estimated $20.6 billion. And finally, the city of Brook Park, which neighbors Cleveland, is signaling their willingness to work with the Browns on a new stadium. The team's lease is up in 2028, and owners D and Jimmy Haslam have said they plan to either stick where they are or build a domed stadium in Brook Park. They would also very much like $1.2 billion in public funds split between state and local governments, and it's not clear if Brook Park is up for making that part happen. J.J. Redick will call the NBA Finals, which start tonight, alongside Doris Burke. That's obviously a very coveted gig, but Redick is reportedly a top candidate for another one, head coach of the Los Angeles Lakers. Redick has never coached in the NBA or college before, but that wouldn't make him unique. Steve Kerr and Jason Kidd went straight from playing to coaching, and they are now considered two of the best. No, what makes the Redick situation strange is that he has a popular podcast with LeBron James, who can decide whether or not to opt out of his final year with the Lakers shortly after the NBA draft. Redick has interviewed with the Raptors last year and the Hornets this year, so it's not like this is only about his relationship with James. But LeBron is a factor in everything the Lakers do, and this summer they might draft his son and hire his co-host. I'm joined now by the founder and president of Sports Solidarity, Harry Marino. Welcome, Harry. Hey, Owen. How are you? Great. Great to have you on. Uh, So... We'll get to sports solidarity very soon. I, I want to start with your efforts around unionizing the minor league minor leagues baseball players in baseball. Uh, so you led the charge to to unionize minor leaguers. This is something that I've been hearing people talk about for a long time. Of you know these players are not treated very well. They don't really get paid very much, um, and you know the working conditions are pretty poor. Why do you think it happened when it happened? Yeah, I mean, look, the as as you referenced, minor league baseball has been a lot of, around a long time, right? I mean, it started in the late 1800s in the U.S. and for the first 150 years, there was no union. Uh, the conditions were never glamorous. Um, when I played in the minor leagues from 2012 to 2014, um, it was really bad. I mean, I made $3,300 my first year in the minor leagues. Players were living six, seven eight guys to a two or three bedroom apartment, working two or three jobs, eating fast food for every meal while trying to stay in shape as a professional athlete. Like it it was really, um, you know, borderline inhumane and, and really um, just not right on a fundamental level. But as you said, you know, people had talked about it, but nothing had ever been done to fix it. That changed in really, it started in 2020 when an organization called Advocates for Minor Leaguers was formed to really set out to try to change the conditions for the first time. Um, It just, before that was not something that anybody had ever tried, bottom line. Uh, The Major League Baseball Players Association had been around since the 1960s and certainly had the power, you know, within the industry to, to at least attempt to do it, but they thought that it was impossible. I mean, Marvin Miller, the, you know, certainly the greatest sort of sports union leader in the history of the U.S., I think, by most accounts, said on the record, I think less than 15 years ago, that he thought it was impossible. Um, You know, as recently as, I think, five years ago, uh, you know, 2018, 2019, 
the MLBPA leadership was still saying the same thing that it was never going to happen. So really the, the start was just forming an organization to try to actually start to organize the players. And that group led by Bill Fletcher, um, Garrett Brochhaus, Matt Prey, Ty Kelly, Roel Jacobson, some former players, uh, I wasn't part of the founding group, set out to make a change in, in, in the conditions. And in 2021, uh, when I took over as the first executive director of the organization, you know, it was very clear to me right off the bat that the only way to really change the conditions was going to be to unionize. And, you know, anything short of that was not going to give us a permanent seat at the table as minor league players. And so that's really what we set out to do. We set the goal of, of actually forming a union and built it from the ground up. I mean, I can certainly explain the whole process. It would take a little bit of time to probably to do the whole thing, but I mean, the, the broadest strokes, you know, are, are that you come in and you just start by talking to the players and there's really no substitute for just starting. And that's really where it, where it began. Yeah. And in terms of you know, the reception you got from players when you started talking to them, given the conditions you described, I'd imagine they would be, you know, uh, open to the idea of unionizing and fighting for their rights. Um, was that the case that people were, were pretty ready to go? You know, it's funny. Yes and no. I think that conceptually we should form a union. Our voices should be heard. We're not being treated right. Yes. Um, coming out in public or actually, you know, joining meetings or signing up uh, and sort of coming out into the open, that's a harder, that's a harder step to take. And, and understandably, right? Because there's a fear associated with rocking the boat and being involved in this kind of a labor organizing effort. So when we started, I mean, we literally started, I sent, you know, 5,000 Instagram messages to every minor league baseball player. And probably got, I don't know, maybe a hundred responses, not a ton. I mean, granted social media, blind DM, but once you started to, you know, get players on the phone, right. And talk about the need to come together. There was certainly among the players who were receptive, you know, to engaging in the first instance, an understanding of the difference that a union can make. And then from there, it's all about solidarity across the group. So once you get those players into a group setting, Right. Um, you know, I remember the first Zoom call with a dozen guys and they can look around the room and say, OK, there's other guys out here who are also doing this. That's where it starts to build. And that's really, you know, the key is starting, to, you know, is strength in numbers and and seeing that there are other guys out there who are looking to make the same change you are. And that builds on builds on itself over time. Yeah. And I have to imagine that seeing other people doing the same thing is is what makes it all work, because all but, you know, one or 2% of those guys are very cuttable in terms of, you know, like, oh, you're causing trouble. It's like, well, you, you might've been a good relief pitcher or something, but like, eh, like, you know, you're not worth the trouble most of the time. Yeah. How much, so on the, um, the MLBPA side of this, I find interesting because, and you described it as they're seeing this task as essentially just, just too big a lift. But also I'm wondering if they're, if they wanted to make that lift in the first place, because it's only recently that the MLBPA even kind of started fighting for pre-arbitration major leaguers um, that, you know, they are building up the the players who, yeah, are still, you know, that's what the last big CBA fight was over was um, the players that are in the majors, but still on their, their minor league contracts, or not minor league contracts on their minimum league minimum contracts or, um, or, or their arbitration contracts. Um, because it was sort of like, once you've got you know, your five, six years in the majors, then, then all the MLBPA benefits really kick in. To what degree do you think there is this sense of there are just limited numbers of dollars and they want as many of those dollars as they can get? Yeah, look, I think that there's a lot to what, you know, to what you're pointing out. I think that for 60 years, the major league players, you know, all who had come through the minor leagues, you know, didn't take that affirmative step of trying to organize minor league players when certainly they knew that the conditions weren't good and they could have. And I think the reason why it comes back to a lot of what you're saying, which is there's this sense of there being a finite pie and, you know, the, the allocation of it towards 
the people who are, you know, perhaps the most powerful, have the biggest voice in the industry is going to be sort of the default. You know, what I would say is that's a bit of a false conception because what turns out to be the case is the broader group that you have, the more folks that you have that are sticking together and fighting together, the better that everyone can do across the board. So this, you know, this idea that there's a, you know, a finite pie and it's, uh, and it has to just be divvied up, you know, either to the, you know, the, the biggest free agents or to the, you know, pre-arb guys or to the minor league guys, it's a convenient argument from the other side of the table, from the league side, but it's not, it doesn't turn out to be entirely true. Right. And so that I think was a big, a big part of this progression was kind of cutting through some of that, um, some of that mythology. And I think, you know, the other piece of this is there's just a changing perception uh, among players about whether that kind of winner takes all system of let's, you know, roll the dice and hope I become, you know, the, the guy who makes it through six, 10 years and then can get a big free agent contract is, is just less attractive. I think more and more players are conscious of the value they're providing from the very time that they sign all the way through the minor leagues, through their rookie, you know, contract, um, and, and think that they should be sharing in, you know, in, in the reward earlier in their career and that it really shouldn't be a system of the haves and the have nots, but that there should be more equity across the board. And I think that that's an evolving position that players are, are having. And, and that's part of what also led to, to the minor league, uh, you know, the minor league unionization effort. Yeah. I mean, there really is, it's two very different pictures. If you look at it as, you know, like the 1% who make it and, you know, become multi, multi-millionaires and, you know, are, are the baseball stars we all know versus like the collective minor leagues are the entire next generation of baseball players. So all the value from, you know, whatever, 2030 to 2040 right now, I mean, not all of it, but much of it is in the minor leagues right now. So collectively that's all of baseball. Um, but if you just look at the major leaguers and, you know, who makes it out of that system, um, it's, you know, it's, it's just a very small fraction. So obviously yeah, the, that mindset is, is, it makes a huge difference. I want to get to sports solidarity. So this is your new organization to advocate for people across the sports industry. Why is this the right time for an organization like this? The bottom line is because the demand is there and, and really the need is not being met. So, you know, to back up, a second to the origin of this organization, it really came out of the success of the minor league unionization effort where we took this, you know, task that was seen as impossible, 6,000 players across, you know, 150 teams and 38 states and, you know, just this sort of Herculean organizing task that had been dismissed as impossible. We accomplished it in a couple of years and then negotiated a CBA worth, you know, somewhere around, I think, $600 million to the players doubling, tripling pay for the players, you know, free housing, meals, transportation, really a transformative CBA. When that hit the news and people started to see that pretty quickly, I and some other folks that I, you know, have worked with over the last few years with advocates for minor leaguers started to receive outreach from folks across different groups, you know, sports, yes, primarily, but also candidly, even beyond sports interested in organizing. And not just athletes, um, you know, college and professional, but also coaches and referees and scouts and trainers and stadium workers. I mean, you name it, I or, or someone from my team has heard from folks in those groups. And so my, really my initial instinct was to find the right folks to help these people, right? When they came and said, hey, how do we organize? Can you help us? I started thinking, okay, who, whose direction can I point? these folks in. And what I realized pretty quickly was that there really was no such organization to point them to. There was no organization out there who was interested or is interested in organizing workers across the sports industry, across the board. Um, and so there's really, I was pretty shocked as we started to dig into it, nearly a million workers across sports, when you really think about the industry broadly, and again, beyond just players, who don't have a union. And after having that realization and, and talking to people who I really trust, 
um, I decided that now was the right time to kind of create that organization and to really take on this project of trying to organize the rest of, of the workers in the sports industry. And that's how, um, how sports solidarity was born. And do you think this will ultimately be one organization? I mean, just because you're, you're talking about everything from, you know, assistant coaches to, um, you know, hot dog vendors. And I'm, I'm wondering if, if those are in fact the same group and if those, those people will have solidarity with each other and be advocating for similar enough things for, to go under one umbrella. Yeah, look, I think my perspective is that all workers are going to be stronger when they stick together on some level. Now, does that mean that they're all going to be in the same bargaining unit or in the same political structure, in the same union? Not necessarily. And I would say that project, you know, for us is really about making sure that all of these workers have a voice, whether that voice is through an independent union, is through partnering up with an existing union, whether it's the same union that they partner up with or different ones. However you slice up the bargaining units, I think those are all fair questions. And, and I don't necessarily see it as being a, a monolith at the end of the day, but I do think there is more overlap between these groups than has been sort of accepted in the past. I do think when you start to think about the fights that the, you know, stadium workers for the angels who are out, you know, uh, last week, I saw something that, you know, they, they went out onto the concourse to during their break to protest some of the conditions, you know, that fight is really the same as the fight that the major league and minor league players are having at the bargaining table every five years. And while those things have been disconnected and while maybe you know, they don't need to be in the same exact bargaining unit or the same union. Um, there is a level of connection and solidarity between the groups that's going to lift up both groups in the long run. And I do think that, um, you know, this project hopefully will in the long run prove that. And I know that the, you know, the organization comes before the, the advocacy and the, the bargaining, but I do wonder if there are some things that are at the you know, top of the to-do list in terms of the, the rights and benefits that, you anticipate fighting for here? Yeah, I think it depends on the group, right? So obviously you have everything from college athletes who are watching seismic, you know, changes happen to the industry and the one group that's seemingly left out of the conversation are the athletes themselves. That's a huge problem. Um, you know, to groups that are more established that maybe haven't had the kind of bargaining power, um, the kind of success from an organizing perspective. Um, that they want to, that just need to figure out how do we get over the hump? How do we actually formalize this effort that we've undertaken um, for years to try to, you know, chip away at the edges? How do we f finally unionize and actually get to the table and bargain for better conditions, better pay, um, better benefits, better hours, whatever the case may be. So again, I think it's very dependent on the group, but at the end of the day, the biggest, you know, the biggest sort of underlying uh, assumption or underlying belief of, of our organization at Sports Solidarity is that nobody knows better what should happen in these industries than the workers, that all the workers deserve a voice. And really we see our project as lifting up those voices, bringing the workers together to articulate what it is that they really want to prioritize and how they think the future of their industry should be shaped. And, you know, third parties, and outsiders can't do that for them. The only way to make that happen is to actually organize workers and 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 make sure that they have a seat at the table and a voice. And how they choose to use that voice is is ultimately up to them. Um, and and we think that there's a lot that can be accomplished if if these million workers organize and join unions. And of the big U.S. leagues, sports leagues, um, are there some that you think are you know have a a better relationship than others with, you know, with their workers and, and some that you, you would put at the bottom of the list? It's hard to say. Look, I think that as some of the leagues have gotten more progressive, they've realized that partnering with the athletes or the workers, the people who are actually delivering value day in and day out is additive for everyone, right? It's the best way to create a better product, which in turn generates more revenue, which in turn leads to everyone winning, right? And so while you have certainly the historic battles, you know, between the Major League Baseball Players Association and MLB going back 
for 60 years and all kinds of strikes and lockouts and animosity between the sides, you're now looking at just a different period in terms of sports business. The amount of dollars and cents associated with sports right now is obviously unprecedented. There is a big pie to go around. And I think there is an understanding that working more collaboratively to grow that pie is in the interests of everyone. And I think that there are folks on both sides of the table across sports who are starting to have that realization and what has been historically, at least in some contexts, a really adversarial process. And which, to be clear, at its core is always going to be somewhat adversarial because different interests and, and different folks bargaining for, for you know, a, a different group of people. Ultimately, there is some ability for for both sides to win in 2024 and in, in big, you know, in big sports. And I think, um, I think people are starting to realize that. Yum. And you and Josh Tolley, you know, former major league catcher, who you're now working with sports solidarity. Uh, you had some complaints about the MLBPA leadership earlier this year. What did you take issue with? You know, look, I think that what we saw happen back in March was for about 10 days, you know, I basically unexpectedly kind of became the face of what has been an underground movement to move the MLBPA in a better direction over the last several years. Um, you know, I think the two biggest things are the idea of, you know, running an audit around some of the spending to make sure that players dues are being respected and also just improving the caliber of the staff. I mean, the MLBPA has historically been, you know, really well regarded in terms of the advocacy from people like, you know, Marvin Miller and Don Fear and all that. And I think there's just a lot of folks in the baseball industry who want to see the MLBPA continue to be at that level and, and feel candidly like it's it's fallen short in recent years. And so, like I said, for, for people on the inside of the baseball industry, that's something that's been a bit of a, you know, an open secret and a lot of dialogue around that for a long time. Um, it bubbled to the surface in March, uh, where it goes from now is really up to the players. I mean, that's the beauty of a union is that it's the player's voice and the players get to decide what they want. My, you know, personally, my, my only goal, and I can, uh, I, I can speak for Josh cause I work closely with him. I know it's the same is just to lift up the voices of, you know, the, the players and, and the workers who are actually doing the hard work every day to make their, you know, workplace successful. That's what, animated my work at Advocates for Minor Leaguers. It's what animated my involvement in, you know, trying to move the MLB PA forward. And it's what's animating sports solidarity. So, you know, I felt a certain obligation having seen some of those things from the inside to be a part of the solution when players reached out and asked me to do that. But I candidly feel like I've kind of met that, <laughs> that obligation by shining uh, a light on the problems, bringing them out more into the open. And um, I think, you know, my passion in terms of helping to provide a voice to people who've been silenced before is really going to be best uh, effectuated through sports solidarity. And, and that's really what I'm excited about. And even though the, the lockout, the MLB lockout is, you know, still kind of in recent memory, this CBA only runs another two seasons after this one. What do you think the, the big issues are going to be uh, that the players are going to fight for in the next round of the negotiations? Yeah, look, I think those are conversations that are happening right now. I think like with any union, the only the only folks who can really decide what they want to fight for are the, the workers themselves. Um, I think everyone can look at the industry and see that there are issues in terms of going back to what we were talking about earlier, the allocation of, you know, revenue and, and salaries towards certain ends of the spectrum versus others, making sure that players across the board are being compensated at all stages of their careers, um, that the, the economic system that's being bargained for is reflective of the way that players are actually being paid by teams in 2024 and beyond, I think is a central concern. Um, but ultimately, you know, how exactly that's all going to shake out is again, going to be really up to the players and, and what they're willing to fight for and what they want to prioritize and, and then how they, um, you know, bring together a team to to go to the table with major league baseball to to bargain over that hey marino very interesting stuff thanks so much for joining us on the show absolutely thanks for having me
That's it for today. The NBA Finals start tonight. The NHL Finals start on Saturday, so make sure you are subscribed on Apple, YouTube, or wherever you like to tune in. Thanks for listening. We will see you tomorrow.